Hello everyone, this is going to be your Unit 3 review video. So Unit 3 was all about civil liberties and civil rights. Before I get into the details of your Unit 3 review video, I just want to say that there are going to be times where specifically um, there's going to be slides with details about a SCOTUS case um, or instances where there's a lot of important information and I just tell you to pause the video. Um, so please don't take that as that not being an important information. I'm just trying to truncate this video um, in as short amount of time as possible. So it's very accessible to you guys, but please pause the video and read the slides. Um, so the first thing that you have to know that there's a distinction between the two civil liberties and civil rights, even though they're often conflated. Um, so the definitions are right there. Civil liberties generally applies to those protections from the uh, enjoyed by everyone from the abuse of government power, like freedom of speech, um, uh, freedom of the press. Um, civil rights are used specifically to describe protections from discrimination based on race, gender, or other minority status. Um, often the term is used to refer specifically to the struggle, struggles of African Americans for equal status. Um, I think I told you guys the story about um, having this FRQ question on my own EP government exam six or seven years ago when I took the class. Uh, what is the difference between civil rights and civil liberties and give an example and I didn't know so I've scored poorly on that FRQ and that's probably why I got a four um, because I didn't have a good AP government teacher. So this is kind of like a cheat sheet um, because really this whole unit was about the Bill of Rights and Supreme Court cases that are um, extending protections um, or defining or, defi or setting limits to um, the protections enumerated in the Bill of Rights um, and and um, um, uh, um, through or SCOTUS cases uh, setting uh, limitations on on the uh, protections um, and, and clarifying the the extent by which these rights um, um, exist in our society. Um, we talked a lot about um, the importance of judicial opinions, the importance of judicial decisions in our legal system. We said that um, we talked about this concept of stare decisis and precedent and how our law um, really is a combination of both laws passed by Congress, um, but also um, the interpretation of uh, justices on the Supreme Court of the United States Constitution, right? All of that becomes um, law. Our system is a little weird and we'll talk more about our weird system towards the end of this video when we're going to look at the roundhouse again. Uh, but for right now, just know um, that our system is a, is a bit uh, um, weird and interesting. Um, this is kind of like a cheat sheet. Um, I would add the 14th Amendment to the United States Constitution. You have to know all of those um, specific clauses in some of them, um, and we'll talk more about that. Specifically in the Bill of Rights, freedom of uh, the First Amendment, the Second Amendment, um, all these rights of the accused amendments um, are important. The Fourth Amendment right of uh, uh, prohibition against unreasonable search and seizure, the Eighth Amendment prohibition against cruel and unusual punishment. Um, and um, those are are really important to know. And basically, this unit was all about Supreme Court cases um, and then um, um, legislation that um, either expands or sets limits on these rights. So the first thing that we talked about was actually freedom of speech. We talked about freedom of speech within the. Um, uh, we looked at two SCOTUS cases that related to freedom of speech. Hi, Anya. We looked at two SCOTUS cases that related to freedom of speech. Um, so the first SCOTUS case. Or before here is the um, guarantee against freedom of speech or guarantee of freedom of speech in the uh, First Amendment to the United States Con Constitution. So Congress shall make no law respecting establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof or bridging the freedom of speech. We looked at two specific Supreme Court cases. We looked at Schenck versus the United States. Or I'm sorry, we just looked at one Supreme Court case, Schenck versus the United States. Um, here's the IRAC of Schenck versus the United States. Before I get into that, we also looked at Emily Bazelon's um, Peace, Better Judgment in the New York Times Magazine, which talked about this idea of judicial precedent and the importance of judicial decision making, and also this idea that uh, judges themselves can change their mind. Um, so in the cites a Supreme Court justice that has uh, that issues a ruling on in Schenck versus the United States that a lot of us um, might feel that 
uh, unnecessarily or might feel um, conflicts with uh, with the right protected in in um, the First Amendment to the Constitution, um, but he changes his mind about um, the limits that Schenck versus the United States uh, puts on freedom of speech uh, later on in a different judicial uh, opinion. But here's the Iraq for Schenck versus the United States. Um, so Schenck, remember, he was a socialist that was passing out leaflets trying to encourage people to dodge um, the draft and 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 um, um, the World War One draft and um, the he was convicted under the Espionage Act. Um, he claimed that it violated his First Amendment right to freedom of speech. Um, the court ruled that actually the conviction was lawful, that the Espionage Act was in um, comportment with the Constitution of the United States. Uh, the Supreme Court said that that, that Shank versus the United States presented a clear and present danger, or Shank versus present danger, and that precedent has survived. That clear and present danger uh, precedent has survived, and that has kind of um, helped um, shape, for better or for worse, the limits um, of, of freedom of speech. Um, Scotus says it did not violate the con his First Amendment right, so that's important. Of course, there are other freedom of speech cases that we'll look at and, and that have since kind of extended and, and expanded um, the uh, freedom of speech right. Um, but certainly Schenck versus the United States is seen as kind of limiting freedom of speech. Um, the precedent that kind of has survived and is still cited to this day is the clear and present danger test, uh, which is often used in judicial uh, decisions to um, identify uh, freedom of of, of speech. Identify whether something uh, is not protected as free speech. Then we looked at Tinker versus Du Bois. We discussed the complicated nature of the Vietnam War. We looked specifically, here's the Iraq for Tinker versus Du Bois. Um, and the Supreme Court ruling was that symbolic uh, free speech, um, please pause the video to get the Iraq if you need it. The Tinker ruling was that um, 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 the armbands that were worn by the students protesting the Vietnam War was protected symbolic free speech. Um, and the court, uh, one famous line from the decision was that uh, teachers and students don't um, leave their uh, free speech rights at the door, at the schoolhouse door when they when they enter the school. I'm paraphrasing, of course. Here are some things that are not free speech that has since been clarified by Supreme Court rulings. We can see Shank versus U.S. sets this precedent that to, set, to incite actions that would harm others is not protected free speech. Roth versus United States um, talks about making and distributing obscene materials not protected free speech. The advocation of illegal drug use at a school event is not protected. A freedom of religion. We also talked about freedom of religion. Uh, here is the part of the First Amendment of the Constitution that is most relevant or relevant. It says pretty explicitly, Congress shall make no law respecting the establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof. In blue, you can see is the establishment clause. Hey, Michael, I'm recording. Oh. So Congress shall make no law respecting the establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof. Um, so in blue, you can see highlighted. Thank you, Jay. In blue, you can see highlighted is the establishment clause and in green you can see is the free exercise clause. The establishment clause um, right here you can see a political cartoon of the established of some somebody that is not following the establishment clause and it says um, this clause uh, forbids the government from establishing an official religion but also prohibits government's actions that unduly favor one religion over another. Yeah, the, yeah as AJ is saying right now I'm recording your um, AJ saying right now there's um, we had talked about the Muslim ban, for instance, which is which um, in Sally Yates's mind was a clear violation of the establishment clause. Um, the free exercise clause uh, reserves the rights of American. Michael, you can sit down and eat breakfast. Oh, I don't even have breakfast. Oh, 
Now I'm going to check the day later on. I hope you didn't go. So the free exercise clause reserves the right of American citizens to accept any religious belief and engage in religious rituals. The clause protects not just religious belief, but actions made on behalf of those beliefs. Um, so we talked about Sally Yates, as I was just discussing with AJ. Sally Yates was a holdover from the Obama administration. And um, in President Trump's 2016 campaign, he um, advocated for um, um, shutting down Muslims from entering the United States until, quote unquote, we could figure out what the hell was going on. Um, Sally Yates was um, an Obama administration official. Um, Trump's attorney general, Jeff Sessions, was obviously going through the confirmation process. Um, and she decided to, um, after the Trump administration decided to enact a ban against several Muslim majority countries um, and the Trump administration was sued, she directed the Justice Department not to defend President Trump's um, uh, ban um, against um, nationals and Muslim majority nations um, on the grounds that it was violative of the Establishment Clause of the United States Constitution uh, because of President Trump's previous remarks. Um, so there's a good lawfare analysis piece that I'll post in the description of this YouTube video. Um, does campaign rhetoric matter um, in determining the lawfulness of an act? Um, what are the ways in which the Trump administration managed to enact some sort of ban after defeating, being defeated several times in court? Um, against uh, predominantly Muslim majority nations, all that good stuff. And Sally Yates, by the way, is probably going to be uh, one of the front runners to be uh, President elect Biden's um, Attorney General. So we did, we looked at two freedom of religion cases. Um, Engel versus Vitali is very much an establishment clause case. And so you can see right here in the IRAC, I put establishment clause. Um, and then um, Wisconsin versus Yoder, which we'll discuss in a bit, is very much a free exercise clause case. Um, so uh, you can see right here that um, this was a Supreme Court case very much about the um, Establishment Clause and related to the Establishment Clause of the Constitution. You can go ahead and read the facts of the case there. In Wisconsin versus Yoder, it was about a free, the free exercise of religion, determining whether compulsory school education, um, you know, unduly interfered with someone's um, free ex ability to exercise um, their religion. And you could see the ruling there. So go ahead and pause the video and look at the ruling. Remember that these establish important precedents by which uh, justices and judges cite later on down the line uh, based on this principle of stare decisis, let the decision stand. They often appeal to precedent. Supreme Court justices can overturn precedent um, and they have in the past, but generally they try to um, cite precedent and, and let the decision stand, but they don't have to. So there's a sort of stability within our um, judicial or legal system and judicial system. Um, so these precedents are important. And then the SCOTUS application question is going to ask you to compare the Supreme Court cases that we have identified with another Supreme Court case, and you're going to have to identify um, kind of the differences. So you're going to need to know these IRACs. Then we also talked freedom of speech. We talked about the Pentagon Papers, which we're not going to talk a lot about now, leaking all national security stuff. This is a cool museum um, that actually down in Washington, D.C. It's called the Newseum. Um, it's a museum about the news media. It's beautiful. I mean, I have such a fantastic experience going through this, and I'm so sad that it's closing down. Now, John Hopkins University is going to build or has bought this building. Um, but you can see right here in the the left hand side, this concrete, um, I guess, monument to, and you can see right here is the first amendment to the constitution um it's really really interesting so i'll include these articles in the description we also talked about the pentagon papers national security leak i'll include all these different things that we talked about in the description we talked about this this importance um and this essential tension which we've 
kind of identified with that has existed between civil liberties and security. Um, this idea about um, um, leaks from um, the government and, and uh, the news media reporting on those leaks. Um, is it important? Um, um, what what comes with the nature of this? Um, all that other stuff. Bye, Michael. You have a good one. News outlets. Uh, we talked about the different quality of news outlets a bit too. Um, so yeah, there's no news outlets. Uh, news outlets. Um, there are different journalistic standards for sure. Um, Mr. Diaz loves to read the Times and Washington Post, the Atlantic, um, all those good stuff. Iraq for the Supreme Court case that was relevant to freedom of the press. Um, it dealt with the Nixon administration's efforts to stop the publication of classified material. Remember we talked about, we saw excerpts from the movie The Post. Um, we, we um, the one starring Meryl Streep and, and um, uh, Tom Hanks. We talked generally about uh, the Nixon administration's, um, or I'm sorry, um, in the Pentagon Papers, um, it detailed a that there was um, um, uh, effort by several presidential administrations to mislead the American <coughs> public about the Vietnam War, um, and the New York Times was publishing articles um, the Nixon administration sought an injunction, a judicial injunction that that stopped the publication, and they were to, trying to uh, stop the New York Times from continuing to publish um, the Pentagon Papers, um, citing national security concerns. Mm -hmm. um, so this was an important Supreme Court decision, um, and the court held that the government did not overcome the heavy presumption against prior restraint of the press in this case. And Justices Black and Douglas argued the vague work security should not be used to abrogate or to limit the fundamental law embodied in the First Amendment. Uh, so this is a huge freedom of the press uh, case. The Nixon administration's efforts to prevent the publication of what it termed classified information violated the First Amendment. OK, cool. And then this is an example SCOTUS application question um, that uh, we wrestled with a bit. Um, so you can see right here that they're going to show you a Supreme Court case that you're not familiar with and ask you to compare it to one of the required cases that you should be familiar with. Right here you can see Second Amendment right to bear arms. We talked about the right to bear arms generally and Second Amendment cases. You can see right here, um, here's the Second Amendment right to keep and bear arms, a well-regulated militia being necessary to the security of a free state, the right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. We talked about several Supreme Court cases related to the right to keep and bear arms. United States versus Lopez is actually not a Second Amendment case. It's more so a case about the Commerce Clause and federalism. Remember federalism from Unit 1? If you don't, then federalism is basically this idea of the sharing of power between state and, federal, and the federal government. And also this idea, uh, we talked about this trend um, in federalism where there's been increasing power um, accrued by the federal government um, at the expense of state government power um, throughout American history. That's a general trend. Um, so the facts, Alfonso Lopez was arrested for taking a gun to school. He was tried and convicted for violating the Federal Gun Free Zones Act of 1990. Um, he argued that the act violated the Constitution and therefore the federal charges could not be brought against him. Uh, the federal government argued that the law was constitutional based on the Commerce Clause firearms for interstate commerce. Remember how we talked about how the Commerce Clause has essentially become this um, mechanism by which the federal government has accrued increasing state, uh, increasing power. To coin Maggie, uh, where is it? Article 1, Section 8, Clause 3, to regulate commerce with foreign nations and among the several states and within the Indian tribes. Um, and they kind of just have an expansive view of commerce. Um, I'm going to include a commentary, uh, the weaponization of the free exercise clause from, um, or not the free exercise clause. I'm going to include commentary from this conservative perspective on the commerce clause that I think is really interesting from the Atlantic. He's a civil libertarian, uh, interesting civil libertarian perspective on um, the twisting of the language of the Commerce Clause to accrue federal government power at the expense of the states. 
um, but I'm going to label it commentary. Uh, there's actually a lot of controversial commentary that I'm going to include in the description, but I will label it as such. Um, the Supreme Court actually struck back at the federal government. They kind of um, seem to like attack this general trend of increasing federal government power, um, saying that the Commerce Clause was not a blank check by which uh, the government could claim to regulate all aspects of everything. Um, and so um, um, Lopez was not charged for a federal crime, but he was eventually charged and did end up in jail nonetheless, which is interesting. So this is not a second amendment case, but it's more about federalism. So be careful with that. In DC versus Heller, which is very much a second amendment case, um, the question was, do the provisions of the District Columbia Code that restrict the licensing of handguns and require a licensed firearm kept in the home to be kept non-functional violate the second amendment? Um, remember that the rule that applies here is the second amendment. We discussed how the second amendment, the um, first clause is a well, talks about a well-regulated militia. Um, the justices rule in this Heller decision that um, there's a certain um, uh, substantive uh, fundamental right to individual gun ownership that historically um, existed um, um, and therefore, um, or actually, no, I, I, I don't want to talk out of my, my behind. But the Heller decision was incredibly important. Um, it was incredibly important Second Amendment uh, case that um, said that the Second Amendment protected the right to possess a firearm, even such possession is unconnected to service in a militia. Um, and so they, they ruled that the DC law violates Second Amendment rights. But what is important is that DC is not a state. Um, they are basically, you know, under the auspices of the federal government. Um, if DC passes a law that Congress doesn't like, uh, Congress can overrule them. Um, um, as someone that used to be a DC resident, it's kind of annoying, but it's the truth. Um, and so uh, we had talked about, um, I guess at the beginning of class, or, or this I, that the Bill of Rights originally only applied to the federal government, and gradually it becomes incorporated to apply to state governments as well. The process by which it becomes incorporated to apply to state governments is through this process called incorporation. And specifically, uh, justices use the 14th Amendment as a mechanism by which they apply the Bill of Rights to state governments as well. Um, so right here you can see the 14th Amendment. Remember the 14th Amendment was passed after the Civil War. Um, the 14th Amendment right here is one of the longest amendments to the Constitution. Um, the most important phrases here are no state shall make or enforce any law which shall abridge the privileges or immunities of the citizens of the United States. Not so much important anymore, but nor shall any state deprive any person of life, liberty, or property without due process of law. I'm going to talk about what due process of law is right now, or to deny any person within this jurisdiction the equal protection of laws. The due process clause and the equal protection of the law, equal protection clause are the most important components of the 14th Amendment, note both. So what is due process? Nor shall any state deprive any person of life, liberty, or property without due process of law. Well, due process, it's basically the same language in the Fifth Amendment to the United States Constitution, but in the 14th Amendment. And due process means two things, right? So there's procedural due process, which has concerns the procedures that governments follow before it deprives any individual of life, liberty, or property. So we had discussed this example before. Um, so process is important for preserving rights. And we gave the example of a student getting knifed or like stabbed in the neck with a pencil. Right, I, Mr. Diaz, can't expel the student. There's a process that needs to take place before the student can be expelled. And we expect within that process, um, there's a protection of that student's rights, right? There's there's something sacred about the process itself that is important, um, it, it, that needs to be undergone, undergone to make sure that there are not arbitrary decisions or random decisions about who is expelled in this classroom and who isn't, right? There's a process. Same idea behind the importance of due process and due process is most relevant for like the rights of the accused, you know, the ability to have a trial in front of a jury of your peers, um, the ability to know what you're charged for, the, the, the right for counsel, all those procedural protections are important, um, at least within our system and, and a lot of um, legal systems, because in theory they're supposed to protect you against arbitrary government action. Then there's this other thing that's a little bit more theoretical that I might not do a very 
good job of explaining, but substantive due process. It's a very controversial um, idea. And so I'll put in the description um, like a Federalist Society, which is like a conservative um, uh, lawyers association, um, um, and then a couple of articles from The Atlantic um, that are skeptical of substantive due process or um, um, embrace of due process. So substantive due process is this idea that uh, it, it asks the question whether the government's deprivation of life, liberty, and property is justified by a sufficient purpose. And substantive due process um, gets into the realm of there are some things where no matter how much process is given, they cannot be deprived. Um, the problem with substantive due process, or I guess not the problem, but the due process clause of the 14th Amendment, no person shall be deprived of life, liberty, or property without due process of law, is, um, is this idea that um, it leaves open justice's ability to, um, in part, uh, using the due, pro the, the due process clause, in part their own views about what is a fundamental right that should, um, you know, no matter how much process is given, should be protected. Um, and we'll talk more about that later. I can include some articles and descriptions about substantive due process and judicial decisions regarding the right to marry, um, same-sex marriage, um, and um, the right um, to own a firearm. All right. So actually, we read an article about substantive due process, I think, from the National Constitution Center, um, which you can see here. Selective incorporation. Oh, then we discussed the incorporation doctrine, and it's just, um, the the Supreme Court has pursued this policy of incorporating, um, you know, provisions in the Bill of Rights. Not all of the provisions of the Bill of Rights have been incorporated to um, the states yet, but most of them are um, to apply for the states, and they use the Fourteenth Amendment as a mechanism to do that. Um, yeah. see that here. These are the ones that have yet to be incorporated. Um, here's just a list. You don't have to know privileges and immunities clause for this class, but for procedural due process rights we have through the process of investigation. These are some examples. Substantive due process. Um, substantive due process are rights we have that are material of substance. Um, freedom of religion, freedom of association, freedom of conscience, freedom to petition for redress or grievances, right to self-determination. Um, these are all um, rights that are either enumerated in the Constitution, which makes them easy, right, and non-controversial. If they're enumerated in the Constitution, if you can find them in the Constitution, then a lot of people think, well, OK, yeah, that's fine. But then when we get a little bit more abstract, because if you look at the language of the Ninth Amendment, they talk about rights that have not been enumerated in the Constitution, but are still reserved by the people and should not be abrogated or interfered upon, then it leaves a mechanism by which um, SCOTUS justices can in some people's views, create rights willy nilly. But then, of course, there's been different judicial precedents that have set limits on what um, what is a fundamental right that that can be um, protected using um, the due process clause of the Fourteenth Amendment. And and we'll, I, we were not going to get into that that level. Um, equal protection, you can see here, government actions and laws are restricted when classifying recipients and non-recipients. The government discriminates against us all the time. Like, I, you have to be a certain age before you can drink. You have to be a certain age before you can, um, you can um, 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 vote. Um, however, they have to have rationale behind it. Um, and there's different types of tests that they have set up. So McDonald versus Chicago is very much a incorporation case that incorporates the Heller decision. This idea that there's um, a fundamental right to individual right to own a handgun um, to the states as well. And it says that the Heller decision, DC versus Heller, also applies to the states as well. So it incorporates the Second Amendment. So it's very much a due process case. You can see that. Then we talked about the Fourth Amendment to the United States Constitution, and we also talked about the Eighth Amendment prohibition on, um, um, uh, on cruel and unusual punishment. We looked at the Snowden case to talk about the fourth, and fourth, or not the Snowden case, but the NSA collection of bulk metadata to talk about the Fourth Amendment's 
uh, protection against unreasonable search and seizure, and we wrestled with that. And then we also looked at uh, the death penalty very briefly. So the Fourth Amendment's right there, it protects against unreasonable searches and seizures. Again, right, judicial opinion making is what makes the law more clear, right? And judicial decisions are super important because uh, the definitions on unreasonable uh, uh, is important. Um, and the Eighth Amendment, excessive death should not be required, nor excessive fines imposed, nor cruel and unusual punishments inflicted. Okay, awesome. Then we talked about the NSA. I'm not going to go over this again. You don't have to know it. Um, I'll include Obama's speech describing the legal basis by which the NSA collected folk metadata, um, because obviously he's a he was a former constitutional law professor at the University of Chicago, so he has a pretty good, not a pretty good. He's you know, a very good lawyer um, that can help describe, you know, certain stuff for you. So watch his speech if you want. Um, we talked fundamentally about this tension that existed between unreasonable searches and seizure, or we talked fundamentally about this tension that existed between liberties and public order. Um, we've, I'll include a Supreme Court, um, or I'm sorry, not a Supreme Court. I'll include something from Stephen Breyer, who is a Supreme Court justice, um, interesting Supreme Court justice at the Brookings Institution, where he talks about this trade off between civil liberties and order a lot. Um, so on the one hand, um, freedom of speech is a beautiful right, right? But if it's expansive, then the downside would be like slander. The free exercise um, is great, but if it's expansive, um, could you just claim something in you know, you're, there's like a balancing act, right? Um, and there's a constant wrestling with the limits that needs to be imposed upon all these sorts of rights practically, and then a constant wrestling with what is actually protected within the Constitution. Um, then uh, this trade-off between having expansive gun rights and this need for gun regulation to protect public safety, or this perceived trade-off between having digital privacy and the need for the NSA to collect bulk metadata um, to um, uh, stop suspected terrorist attacks. And so there's this constant um, tension between liberties and social order, between liberty and security um, that is both, um, you know, practically debated within our society in terms of policy decisions and then legally debated in terms of what is actually protected in those rights, um, what is the nature of those rights and what can be um, um, justified or what in what ways are those rights limited? And we did an essay. We watched a debate called the Intelligence Squared debate, which I'll include in the description of this YouTube video if you want to re-reference it. Again, there's a lot more sources, guys, out there than whatever the heck you're watching or reading. Um, I'm just trying to probe your thinking as much as possible. So I'll include that in the description of this YouTube video. We wrote thesis statements and all that good stuff. Here's a example essay from the College Board and the response that the instructor made to that example essay, that, as you can see, um, that is related. That is related to the prompt. Then civil rights and civil liberties, due process and the rights of the accused. We talked about the rights of the accused at length. There are several amendments, the Fifth Amendment, uh, says no portion, no shall sure any person be subject to the same offense to be twice put in jeopardy of life or limb, nor shall be compelled in any criminal case to be a witness against himself. This amendment is about protecting process-oriented national rights of citizens when engaging the legal system. Uh, we talked about also pleading the fifth. It protects you against the right for self-incrimination. You can plead the fifth so you don't have to incriminate yourself. Um, it doesn't mean you're guilty, but a lot of people plead the Fifth Amendment um, to protect themselves from having to be deposed and all that good stuff. Or shall any person be subject for the same offense twice? Double jeopardy. You can't be put on trial for the same offense if you've been acquitted. And then here's the due process protection that is basically mirrored in the 14th Amendment, nor be deprived of life, liberty or property without due process of law, which is a super important protection. Here, here we can see oh yeah a grand jury a right to a grand jury this right hasn't been incorporated but the grand jury is interesting um so it hasn't been incorporated but 
there are several states that require grand jury indictment. And so it's this idea of a jury that is presented evidence and they can indict you, so bring charges against you. And they basically say that there's a probable likelihood um, that you have committed a crime. Um, it's a lower threshold from beyond a reasonable doubt. Um, so it basically gives you one trial to be indicted and then one, um, or once you're indicted, the, um, then you're brought you know, to trial. So it's kind of a extra protection, uh, a process protection um, um, that in theory is supposed to protect your rights from arbitrary government abuse. Arizona was an important Supreme Court case, um, which basically said uh, that people that don't take Mr. Diaz's AP government class, that they deserve uh, to know their, or they don't, are very ignorant of their rights. Um, it basically mandates that the police must inform them of their rights before, um, or must inform them of their rights when making an arrest. So we've all heard the Miranda rights on either cops or live PD. Um, you have the right to remain silent. And then you say cannon will be used against you in the court of law. You have the right to attorney. Cannot 411 will be appointed to you. Those that it's important to say those rights um, because or I'm sorry, it's not important. The Miranda versus Arizona mandates that police officers must say those rights before making an arrest. And again, you can see this tension between liberty and order. Um, of course, there was a lot of objections at the time that Miranda versus Arizona was decided, saying that it basically precludes uh, police's ability to um, interrogate in some sense, uh, substantively. But also there are people that, you know, think it's super important. And I think Miranda rights are super important because a lot of people are not fundamentally informed about their rights and they might do something that incriminates themselves without knowing that they actually have a Fifth Amendment right um, against self-incrimination and they could plead the Fifth Amendment. The Sixth Amendment, you see it, um, it's about, again, process-oriented rights. The accused shall enjoy the right to a speedy and public trial by an impartial jury of state and district wherein the crime shall have been committed, which district shall have been previously ascertained by law, and to be informed of the nature and cause of the accusation to be confronted with the witnesses against him. The amendment is about representation. We see a Sixth Amendment case that is super important is Gideon versus Rainwright, which is the right to assistance of counsel. Girls start joining CCR. And then Amendment 14 is selective incorporation principle via due process clause. You can see right here that the Florida state law provides the assistance of public counsel for indigent defendants for capital cases only. So this was this idea. This is a very much a due process case where um, I'm going to pause the video now, actually, but after this, but this is very much a due process case in the sense that um, the court ruled that the Sixth Amendment right to assistance of counsel applied to the states, um, that it was an important right to be able to have counsel um, in cases other than capital offenses. Um, so under Florida state law, um, they only provided counsel or lawyers for people that could not afford them in case, in capital cases. So um, in cases that involved murder and all that good stuff. Um, and Clarence Gideon was arrested and charged with the petty case. Um, so the Supreme Court rules that everyone, no matter how petty the theft or, or petty the crime, uh, should be afforded uh, counsel if they cannot afford one. So it's a hugely important case. Um, I'll also include a description in the description, a article about the nature of the system as it stands, um, the actual quality of the counsel and lawyers uh, that are received by indignant um, um, defenders. Um, a lot of those that counsel um, is stretched thin, doesn't pay very well. Um, and oftentimes the counsel includes something like, please just take the prosecutor's plea deal, um, which you know, arguably is a deficiency in our um, legal system. All right, in the next YouTube video, I'll discuss due process and the right to privacy.